Welcome back to Banfield. There are so many names for it. It's been an issue. It's been a situation, a mess, a crisis, an explosion. I'm talking about the homeless problem in America. But despite all the different ways they've come up with uh, to, to describe it, our lawmakers never seem to come up with a way to solve it. There are right now more than 580,000 homeless people in America. That is over a half million folks. And while you might be surprised by the size of that number, you're probably not surprised by the size of the problem. Anyone who has been to a major U.S. city lately has seen it. People are asleep on the street. People are asking for money on the corners. Um, and the groups erecting massive tent cities in fields and on roads and under bridges. Most of the homeless population, about 70%, are just single individuals, with the rest living as families with children. Which is why a one-size-fits-all approach is a really tricky thing and doesn't work. But that hasn't stopped our lawmakers from trying. Over the years, they've treated the homeless like a nuisance or like victims and even like criminals. But none of those approaches have done the trick. So now they're trying something different. They're treating the homeless like tenants. And they want all of us to be the landlords. How about that? In San Francisco's Bay Area, where there's a homeless population of more than 35,000, some lawmakers and multiple charities are asking local families to open up their doors and let the homeless move in with them. Will it work? Would you do it? Is this really the safest and most effective solution? I'm joined by Richie Greenberg, a former mayoral candidate in San Francisco who calls the idea unrealistic and downright creepy. Christy Carpenter, she's the executive director of the East Bay nonprofit Safe Time, which places homeless families and college students in spare bedrooms. And Alex Buzanski is the founder and president of Impact Justice. His group provides subsidies to homeowners in exchange for renting a room at an affordable rate to somebody returning home from prison. So welcome all three of you. Thank you so much for, for joining. Christy, I'm going to begin with you. 35,000 homeless people in the Bay Area, and you've placed 60 people since 2017, which by the way, congratulations, that's laudable, but holy dina, 60 <laughs> compared to, you know, 35,000, it's a drop in the bucket. Are there enough Good Samaritans even out there? Not yet. Well, I think they're out there, um, and I hope that we can help more people know about programs like Safe Time, which um, are, it's a host home program that houses unhoused people, as you mentioned, in people's homes. Um, and we are looking for more hosts, and uh, you know, the more the more people who um, find it in their hearts to open up their home to someone who is on the streets, um, the smaller that that homeless population becomes. But I think you're right that we can't, we certainly can't do it just on individuals' homes. But I do hope that. Um, we can change the narrative around homelessness so that um, our homeless neighbors are no longer seen as criminals or, you know, dangerous or, you know, nuisances, but rather, you know, those are our neighbors and that, and we all need to help each other out in our communities. Well, you know, call it the danger of a headline or call it what you will, but if you live in New York City, um, you see things like the homeless man that shoves somebody onto the tracks that, because they're mentally disturbed. And the first thing you get a reaction is, are you kidding me? What could possibly go wrong? Well, people and children in those homes, you know, could, could get hurt. So Richie, jump in here. When you said creepy, um, I assume you sort of fall into that the basket of folks who say, this is the dumbest thing ever. Yes, well, uh, thank you for having me. Um, let's not say dumbest thing, but you know, uh, first of all, in San Francisco anyway, a very high percentage, some put it at 60, 65 percent of those homeless are mentally ill, suffering from a mental illness or drug addiction, or one feeds the other. So if we look at that, it would be wholly unrealistic to have any of those individuals who uh, are addicted to drugs, the tents that we see right now on the screen here, uh, those are not really for, for dwelling. That's often to be able to partake in their drug habits. Uh, San Francisco has thousands of these, uh, and, and that's a real big problem. You cannot have these individuals in 
a well-meaning person's home. It is unsafe. It's unrealistic. It's very different from bringing in someone who is down on their luck or a student or perhaps even someone who is uh, previously incarcerated and is coming out of the justice system. This is a very different situation here. And uh, that's the situation that we're finding now, that there are many politicians who are running for office, including in San Francisco this year and next year, who are trying to find some way to, to curry favor with voters with these kind of proposals when they really have very, very little chance of success. So, Alex, you know, on the list of people you might not want to open your door to if there were just a stranger knocking, um, someone who's homeless might be pretty high and definitely an ex-con who just, you know, got out of prison would be on that list too. And yet you're able to find people who um, open their hearts and, and bring in your clients and, um, and give them a safe place. Is it tough? Does it work? Has it backfired? So at Impact Justice, my organization, our initiative is called the Homecoming Project. We place people who have been in prison for at least 10 years into homes of people who have an extra bedroom, and we pay those people a stipend on a daily basis to take individuals in, and we provide some wraparound services using essentially community navigators, life coach-like people, both support the homeowner uh, and the people inside the home and the participant who goes into that home. We find it extraordinarily successful. We have certainly high demand of people getting out of prison, right? They've been in for more than 10 years. We know a lot about them. We know a lot about the hosts. We interview everybody. We try to make good matches. Our biggest problem in keeping hosts isn't that there are problems. In fact, we've had no problems of any significance. Uh, Zero percent activism for people we've placed. The biggest problem is that the hosts and the participants create such a good relationship that the hosts go on enter into a long-term housing relationship with those people. Well, that doesn't sound like a problem at all. That sounds uh, pretty successful. I'm not sure if the homeless will, you know, translate the same way as, as ex-cons, but Christy, the one thing I'm sure everybody watching right now is, what is the vetting process? Because there isn't one of us who hasn't walked down a street and thought, yikes, I think I might cross the street. I'm a little afraid of how that person's behaving. So how do you vet to make sure that there's not a really bad headline that comes out of one of these matchups? Um, I want to, you know, first start off by saying that, you know, being unhoused is, is not a crime. And there are... Um, many reasons why a person would end up unstably housed or unhoused. And many of those are, are, are um, not a reflection on that person's character. And so mm -hmm. I also um, want to you know, acknowledge what um, my colleague is saying, it, just that like not everyone who is unhoused is a good candidate um, for a host home program. And the idea is not to solve um, you know, the homelessness issue with, with one, this one solution, which is host homes. But we do believe that there are people who are, who are um, not who are, who are unhoused, um, who could um, very safely and comfortably and in a positive way move into someone's home. I'm a host myself. I've been hosting for the last five years. And I've, um, you know, uh, I've also never had any problems of significance and have had some wonderful um, relationships result. Now, yeah. so our, Richie, course, I think, you know, Christy makes it, go ahead, Christy. I was going to say, of course, the vetting process and the support along the way is really important. Um, in, in our host home program, the host and the guest meet multiple times before move-in occurs and both need to agree that it is a good match. We do that in addition to um, background checks and reference checks. Ultimately, it is the decision of the host and the guest for the move-in to happen. No one is forced against their will, even once they sign up for the program to take it a specific yeah. individual. But you make a good point that there are a lot of people who, you know, are they don't fall into that category of scary or dangerous um, or troubled or, or mentally ill. But Richie, I do want to read uh, from the National Homelessness Law Center what the five main causes of homelessness are. Lack of affordable housing, unemployment, poverty, mental illness and the lack of needed services, uh, substance abuse and the lack of needed services. And so when I see stats like that, I think, you know, God bless Christie, but where the hell is the government? Where the hell is the, you know, the leadership to, to, to do what these people, God bless them, shouldn't have to do? They shouldn't have to open their own doors and, and you know, fix the, the societal problem of homelessness. This is created from the top. It should be fixed at the top. Where are they? 
Well, um, you brought up actually a very good list of the different categories. And I was actually going to mention that on my own, that uh, what tends to happen uh, is you lump uh, politicians and others lump all the different categories of the type of homeless unhoused into one. And they say we have 30, 35,000 uh, unhoused homeless in, in the Bay Area and we need funding. Well, uh, in reality, when you look at the specific types of homeless, uh, you have those who are the drug addicts and those who are uh, mentally ill, suffering from mental illness. Then you have some that are down their luck. They just lost their job. They were living paycheck to paycheck and they're, they're, they're good people and they maybe are crashing on someone's uh, uh, couch or an extra a bedroom already. Then you have the families uh, that uh, also have uh, on down on their luck. They have the kids that they're trying to put into school and they're living in their car. Uh, and then you have a whole segment of homeless who are homeless by choice. They want to uh, participate in this off the grid mentality where they like living in a tent and they don't want to be bothered. They don't want any government handouts and they just want to be urban camping. So there are multiple types, uh, yeah. multiple categories of homeless. And so what we really need to do is we need to home in, hone in and focus on those that need the help the most. The problem is that the nonprofits that are uh, in San Francisco anyway, that are tending to those that are most in need, meaning the drug addict and the um, those suffering from mental illness, a lot of the homeless organization, outreach organizations are mismarriage or uh, mismanaged, are coming under fire for uh, wasting taxpayers' money. I have to wrap it there, unfortunately, but I, I could talk about this all day because I just find this to be such a sad, um, you know, statement of who we are as a first world nation. Chrissy Carpenter, Richie Greenberg, and Alex Buzanski, thank you all. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.